Welcome back to AI Meets LifeSci. I'm Kayleen Brown, Managing Editor for Device Talk. And I'm Brian Bunce, Editor at Drug Discovery and Development. We are so pleased that you are tuning in for episode three, and we have two fantastic interviews for you. But before we get started with that, I wanted to thank our sponsors. I want to thank all of you listeners for making AI Meets Life Sci happen. Thank you so very much. And I wanted to remind everybody that season one is being simulcasted on the Device Talks podcast network. But after season one, we are solely going to our own network, AI Meets Life Sci. So please subscribe to AI Meets Life Sci on all major podcast platforms. So Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, um, all your favorite ways of podcasting, AI Meets Life Sci. And then do subscribe to us on YouTube. That is Device Talks. We have our podcast there. So wanted to make sure that you don't miss an opportunity to continue with us on season two. So with that little caveat out of the way, Brian, I know that you just came back from JP Morgan, and I know that you've already shared several insights on drug discovery and development. Uh, can you just kind of update us on what were some of your impressions or anything that was uh, a notable takeaway? I interviewed about 15 companies and about half of them had some kind of mention, if not core focus on AI or ML or deep learning. And some of the thoughts that stand out were from Jen, the CEO of 1910 Genetics, who we featured in the last episode. And she said that some smaller to mid-sized biotechs, given their focus on compute, could see their compute bills exceeding that of payroll. And I thought that signal is a potentially interesting time to, to showcase that computing power is now sometimes potentially eclipsing like workforce, but also the challenges involved. Like if it is that expensive for some companies to do like really rigorous deep learning, like I, I talked to a company as well that's using like a supercomputer to process, I think it was trillions of data points for even a small set of patients. Maybe it was in the order of a trillion data points for one patient. It's just massive to think about that data set and about what you could do with it. So I think there's both the potential of now that compute power is advancing so steadily, what we can do with that data, but also the cost of processing that and the expense of, and the difficulties of transmitting that data to process it. So would you say that some of your sort of impressions that you've been getting with all those interviews is uh, speaking to a potential obstacle with AI and machine learning? And the cost? And then what about storage and computing power? So do you think that those would be limitations for companies that are trying to use sort of the power of AI and machine learning? Well, I, th I think one of the things that I've, I've noticed is that essentially all big pharma companies and biotech companies have some kind of like pivotal data strategy or AI strategy, ML strategy, whatever you want to call it. It seems like there's a lot of bespoke work that's involved and one of the comments I heard is that you need to have these big tech companies coming in to help play a role in standardizing and making it easier to do so that it doesn't have to be so hard. And that some of the companies involved in this space don't really have an interest in doing that because they benefit from using exorbitant amounts of processing and like they, they see a tangible benefit to their bottom line for that. So I think what will need to happen is kind of like this joining of forces where you have like the big pharmas and like the smaller biotech companies and the big tech companies all coming together to decide how to work together and how to create a situation in which you have this rising tide lifting all boats and not just one company that's profiting a lot from the other's use of massive amounts of compute or storage or processing or all of the above. So it seems like we need to have this kind of like community approach, kind of like the old adage of it takes a village, I think applies a lot to ML and AI. I think that's really well said. When we talk about a lot of the positives, we haven't talked a lot about sort of the obstacles that are coming out of it, but I, I think your you know, kind of boots on the ground approach that you've been having and talking to these kind of rising stars have really started showing where these obstacles could be and I'm reiterating sort of what you already said that it's about collaboration and partnering might be the only way that we can overcome that obstacle which 
leads us right into our first interview. So we're in the first keynote interview of uh, episode three is with Ben Newton. Ben is the chief digital officer and GM of oncology at GE Healthcare. Uh, what's interesting, and I know that Brian alluded to this on our previous episode, is that GE Healthcare is a current leader in FDA AI enabled device authorizations for MedTech. They have 58 of the around 700 last I checked, uh, meaning that they are the majority leader. Um, in the episode and in the interview with Ben, uh, Brian and I, we talk about the radiology shortage. We talk about GE's approach to oncology diagnostics and collaboration efforts. So I think that really ties in beautifully to what you were saying, Brian. It takes a village and GE Healthcare very clearly knows that. So with that, Ben Newton, GE Healthcare. Welcome to AI Meets Life Sci, where we explore the transformative impact of artificial intelligence on the life sciences like the start of the dot-com revolution when user-friendly browsers like Netscape open the door to widespread adoption, generative AI technologies like ChatGPT have helped democratize AI, making it accessible to hundreds of millions and completely changing the way we interact with AI and machine learning. In each episode, we'll sit down with medtech, biopharma, and tech companies driving the integration of life sciences and AI. We'll focus on breakthroughs and what's on the horizon, but also guide you past the hype. Join us as we explore and clarify the frontier of AI meets life side. Welcome, Ben. This is our third episode of AI Meets LifeSci, a collaboration between Device Talks and Drug Discovery and Development for WTWH Media. We really appreciate your time with us today. So today we're going to dig into how AI, ML, deep learning, et cetera, are advancing oncology and healthcare from improving diagnostic accuracy and treatment planning to addressing the shortage of radiologists in many parts of the world. So thanks again for joining. To kick things off, I have kind of a, a big umbrella question. Given that AI has become such a buzzword recently, it's often used very loosely, how do you define AI and what does it mean to you? Oh, it's a great question to start off. I think, look, AI for me is the simulation of human intelligence um, by machines, essentially, or computer systems. So something that uh, perhaps is um, a task or um, an interpretation or, or some of the process that can be repeated effectively um, with some intelligence, of course. And of course, that has to be pre-programmed um, by humans, but uh, I, would, I would structure it in, in that way. Mm -hmm. what, what role do you see for AI in addressing global health challenges? So inevitably, um, the development of AI, particularly point solutions that perhaps could um, you know, diagnose disease or prognose disease or predict um, certain outcomes, you need data. So a big aspect of what we're doing, and I think what has emerged over recent years is the uh, need for foundation models. So accessing large data sets that have those features of disease, but also have critically the outcomes, and then exploring relationships between those different features, and they could be pathologic, it could be imaging, it could be demographic um, as well as, um, uh, re and then relating those to the outcome um, it's possible to explore you know, those features and their relationship to outcomes. And then, of course, use those uh, prospectively. So I think, um, I think some of those areas we're looking at very closely. Certainly, there's a lot of um, activity with startups and so on, certainly over the last three, four, five years in this space. And, um, and the space is developing extremely rapidly. You know, you were talking, Ben, about so this kind of rapid adoption. And um, I know that in our sort of pre-discussion, we were talking a little bit about generative AI. Do you mind sharing a little bit about how that may have changed how you see AI, just the fact that generative AI has made AI kind of more democratized or democratized AI for the community? Yeah, well, look, I think we've just seen the tip of the out, uh, tip of the iceberg. Um, with, with generative AI and, and large language models. I talked to a minute ago about foundation models and the ability to establish relationships, hypothesis or data-led relationships and outcomes retrospectively that could be used yeah. prospectively. But I think what's fascinating about generative AI and certainly how we're thinking about it um, 
uh, at G Healthcare is, of course, applying that technology to specific databases means that we could explore um, specific relationships in databases, for example, like hospital uh, databases. When we think about generative AI right now, of course, we think about ChatGTP and using it from uh, a whole um, almost gl global database perspective, but applying that technology um, to discrete databases, say from pathology and um, uh, medical record together with uh, imaging records and making those links between patient identifiers um, in those records will allow us to use generative AI to create um, an understanding of individual patient and perhaps an individual patient's trajectory in terms of their particular outcomes or their particular journey. And, and that can help enormously in determining perhaps what might happen next, for example, or creating reports at the very basic level on um, that patient's data. So I think some of the things that we're doing is probably be perceived as quite basic in terms of reporting and understanding a patient's um, uh, background and, and potentially prognosis. I think there's a lot more to come over the coming years as we start to connect databases in a more structured way and use the large language modeling uh, in a way that is much more proactive and perhaps um, agile within the context of those uh, data, data sets. Given your role as the, the GM of oncology, could you describe G Healthcare's journey in incorporating AI into oncological diagnostics and treatments and, and so on? Yeah, so um, you know, our journey has been in this space very, very rapid. You know, we top the list in terms of AI approvals for, from an FDA approval standpoint amongst medtech companies. And I think, you know, our focus has largely been on uh, on-device AI, AI um, uh, that uh, can support decision-making in imaging, decision-making in monitoring, alerts, for example, uh, in the case of different features being uh, represented or emerging in a patient's record or emerging in an image or, or, or similar. Uh, and I think that is set to continue. We certainly see the value in, in providing clinical decision support at the radiomic level. Um, but I think it's going to get more interesting. Again, as we facilitate the connectivity between different databases um, so that we can visualize data. I mentioned foundation models uh, before and the ability to retrospectively um, develop relationships and develop components that are important in um, you know, predicting disease or, or developing um, algorithms around segmentation of disease or, or even trying to bring uh, images together, for example, all of that's going to um, lead to more AI, more solutions that will um, perhaps spread into a multimodal type of decision making. Right. So as I say, um, a lot of what we've done is looking at data in discrete unimodal environments like imaging, but the more you connect those um, fields together, the more decision making could become multi-mode crossing demographics, pathology, imaging, as well as genomics, for for example. So I think the the ability there to improve the predictive power, as well as uh, improve the quality of decision making around what specifically is going on with a patient, um, will be enhanced further. And as, as I say, um, the work that we can undertake with our foundation models to retrospectively identify those um, relationships could then be prospectively used with that multimodal connectivity that are described. And uh, that, of course, can then enable the prospective use of some of those uh, algorithms as well. So, so I think we're in the, in the, at the threshold of, of, um, of a huge opportunity. And of course, you, you put that together um, with some of the compute power that has been developing over recent years, cloud-based um, analytics, it improves the access to data, improves the ability to analyze that data in real time, and of course, improves the way we can scale and gain adoption for those AI tools as well. So I think we're on the threshold of some major transformations, which will be um, 
critical in, in, in unlocking some of the serious uh, challenges we have in healthcare and capacity and, and, and obviously backlog of patients from a diagnosis and, and precision of uh, therapy selection and things like that. So lots more to come, I think, in this, in this space. A quick follow up to that. So I understand that as you talk about this kind of multimodal, multimodal decision making capacity that is going to potentially shift how medical professionals like collaborate. Like I could, I could imagine like a patient having a care team where you have an oncologist, or radiologist coming together. Um, how does GE work with uh, medical professionals and kind of understanding their pain points, understanding how like this new kind of decision making process could kind of connect the dots for them for for patient care. Do you know, it's a, it's a great question and um, we get asked that a lot, but, you know, it, it actually starts with understanding the patient workflow and the physician's challenges. So, for example, um, understanding how a patient certainly starts their journey, it's challenging with respect to symptom identification and how those symptoms actually may relate to a decision for a referral into a secondary care um, system. And then the course of the tests that are carried out on a patient um, obviously relate to suspicions that the physician has. Um, those tests, blood tests, um, could be cognition tests in, this, in, 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 in dementia, blood tests, imaging tests, and so on, all those data needs to be combined um, for uh, and, and assimilated for a decision to, to be made. And, and I think, you know, this is where the um, challenges are. And when we talk to physicians um, in the last few years, of course, the amount of data, the numbers of tests, the complexity of those tests mean that the amount of information that needs to be assimilated in, in order to make the right decision for the patient is enormous and hugely challenging for any even extremely well qualified uh, physician or caregiver to, to make. Mm. So, and we're seeing that that situation of complexity of, of, um, of information and also complexity of treatment options and combination of treatments kind of com combine um, to, to make it very difficult to make timely and accurate decision making. And then if you factor into that some of the challenges that we've had over recent years, the backlog in cancer diagnosis resulting from the pandemic, for example, we've seen that in prostate cancer, we've seen it in breast, we've seen it in lung. So there are many cancers that are undetected and will late uh, present, they will present much later. Then, of course, um, that adds to capacity just constraints. All of these things can lead to burnout and, of course, huge workflow challenges, as well as shortages of, of the caregivers them, themselves. So all of these things are conspiring to, um, I think, lead to uh, demand for um, workflow solutions, data management solutions, AI orchestration solutions, solutions that will support um, decisions at the point of care from, say, an imaging test perspective. Um, and, and I think it's those needs uh, that will be met in the coming years. It's going to be challenging, don't get me wrong, because, uh, of course, there is limited bandwidth in the system already, particularly with those um, caregivers who have so much to do on a daily basis anyway. So freeing them up to learn and understand how some of these tools can help, uh, you know, alleviate workflow um, bottlenecks or... Um, decisions around uh, how to manage patients is, is going to be a, a, a challenge. But that's something that if we overcome, then, of course, it frees up uh, bandwidth, frees up time to spend uh, with the patients, which is what I think most caregivers go into medicine uh, for. But m more importantly as well is the time that they spend will be more quality time and hopefully lead to the prescription of more precise medicines or indeed the monitoring of the progress on those medicines in a more effective way that has been in the past. So lots of uh, huge opportunities to come, but we've got to get through, I think, some of these huge backlogs, the adoption of the technology, and but out the other side, I think is going to be a, a real tremendous opportunity for, for us all.
it sounds to me, and then I know you have a, a partnership with AWS, but it sounds to me like forging partnerships with other industry stakeholders might be the way to overcome these obstacles and to really seize these opportunities. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. approach making relationships from a GE healthcare perspective with other stakeholders in the industry? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, and I think, you know, the answer to that is it will take a village. You know, we certainly have competence in developing solutions like imaging devices, monitoring devices, injectable diagnostics, and of course, increasingly AI tools. But of course, it's going to take much more than that. We need to work with cloud partners like AWS. We need to work with compute um, best-in-class compute firms. We need to partner with um, uh, big academic centers or hospitals to access data, to create those foundation models. And um, we're doing more of all of those things um, to generate the kinds of precision with it, the tools that uh, are needed and um, requires all of that. But in addition, I think even the generation of AI and um, through, if you like, organic work on foundation models is not just going to be our job. There are so many decisions that need to be made and there are so many capable companies and individuals out there that will have to partner, I think, with third-party tools as well. So having an ecosystem that's open, have an ecosystem that is um, capable of um, integrating uh, additional uh, capabilities and then scaling them, again, using some of those partners like that, uh, uh, AWS, for example, is going to be critical to uh, gaining adoption for these tools and, of course, utilization. So GEA has enormous reach, huge um, potential, huge capability already, but we recognize that if we're going to support precision care um, in terms of diagnosis and monitoring, the treatment and the intervention, particularly in oncology, for example, of which there are three key types, is fundamental. So aligning those into our ecosystem and working with partners who deliver the therapy is part of what we can do. So I'm giving you a, a flavor of the complexity, but also the fact that the cooperation and partnerships involved in order to deliver what we perceive as, as precision health in the future is going to take an enormous amount of cooperation and, um, and capability uh, together. Moving back to the, the topic of clinicians, it seems like radiologists have interacted more with AI tools, probably more than many other different specialists have. And, um, mm -hmm. and it seems like an interesting kind of like topic in that attitudes have shifted where now you mentioned burnout, maybe in the, in the past, like there was some skepticism, but now there's more and more of a recognition that you can detect cancers better. You can boost efficiency. Like you, you can kind of go in the list, but was curious about your thoughts on how radiologist views have, have shifted about AI and about um, what the perspective might be going forward. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I think this is a, a great question because there's, um, I think up to a couple of years ago, there was perhaps a little um, concern over AI. You know, was AI going to replace what I could do? Um, is AI going to ultimately lead to the full automation of image reading. And I think what's very clear is that's not going to happen. What is going to happen is AI can be used in a way that will support radiologists to do um, higher volume of reads, for example. Um, of course, when a radiologist um, looks at a, a scan, they're looking at the whole lung and they have the expertise to look at many features, many uh, issues, and uh, and may pick out multiple problems. When you have an algorithm, say, that will um, identify suspicious nodules, that's all it's going to look for. So by far, a radiologist has much greater capability than AI, without doubt. However, what we can do is use some of the AI to support either second read on a specific suspicious finding or indeed complement or give some decision support around that finding. And turning those tools on to be used could give greater confidence. It could um, support with quality of decision-making, of course, 
and ultimately lead to um, potentially faster decision making as as well. So I think um, you, you know the I talked to several of our, our colleagues internally as well as um, radiologists externally, uh, and I think the prevailing view is that AI is here to stay. It's going to be complementing uh, radiologists, going to be enhancing how they work. And ultimately, what excites me about this whole space, to be perfectly honest, is it can potentially change um, what, how we interpret images. You know, images effectively tell us what has happened. It's a, taking a picture of disease, and that disease has taken hold, and that's why the patient has been referred. What I think is enormously powerful is perhaps converting that image with some additional data into something that is prognostic. In other words, it's potentially changing the view on what might happen in the future. So it's almost a 180 um, change, switching from what has happened to interpreting the image and other factors to say what may happen. And that prognostic power is huge, particularly when it comes to selecting the most optimal therapy, the most precise path, um, both in terms of timing and, of course, the precise medicine or combination of medicine, and that's truly transformative. And I, and I think those are the things that are really exciting radiologists now because actually um, they are in the centre, arguably, as diagnosticians, effectively, is, of disease. Uh, I think it's about uh, empowering uh, them and, and growing um, the ecosystem to support you know the world where we can actually... Um, uh, select the right therapy and, and monitor more precisely. That's very encouraging. It sounds like there's also a sort of a, a mental shift needed here. Uh, I love how, Ben, you were talking about looking how images really are reflective of the past. And it's a shift of a mindset to you know, look to what's not there, what's in the future. Do you right. see any challenges overcoming um, and this shift? the way that we've been thinking for decades? Uh, of, of course. And uh, we, we know that there are challenges around you know, patient security, um, integrity of data, um, certainly in terms of the generalizability of AI. Um, AI is only good as the data that it's being developed on. And of course, AI can make mistakes. So... You know, we've got to be aware of all of these uh, factors of security, of, of generalizability, um, as well as obviously how uh, they are used. And that's another reason why, you know, these tools are not going to be used in isolation. They're going to be used um, uh, together. But I think we will understand the space better. We will be able to um, manage these um, this, this power, if, if you will, to to support decision-making in a step-by-step -step way. Um, there are so many other areas of our life where um, we, we accept AI and perhaps don't even realize it, um, you know, from banking through to air travel and even through to driving our cars or even, you know, operating our own um, uh, heating systems at home, all involve those uh, AI technologies and, and they're accepted as part of our life. Now, healthcare is a much more challenging, it's a much more serious uh, undertaking than many of those examples that I mentioned. And so we've got to have the right kind of balance in how we um, prove out those AI, how we adopt, how we implement, and of course, how we regulate too. Um, and and so uh, I think though the prize is still uh, out there um, because the needs are so great. Um, we have to uh, in, in embrace this kind of uh, technology to meet those needs in the future. So if you were to anticipate some of the transformations in oncology specifically in the next five years, what's to come? What do you see? So I think this is perhaps one of the most uh, exciting areas. So I've talked about um, prognosis and prediction um, of, of outcomes. I think we may see more of those kinds of things. So um, not just prognosing um, disease 
risk stratifying disease um, at the point of screening or diagnosis, but selecting the right therapies based on that retrospective analysis of what worked best for particular patient types. The more we stratify patient types, the more we understand how different subsets of stratified populations respond to therapies, the better we'll be able to prospectively prescribe to those patients that have those set data criteria, if you will, or those eligibilities, so to speak. Um, and so in a way, we can start to personalize and individualize treatments in a, in a, in a, in a much more proactive way. Um, undoubtedly, that's going to take so-called big data. It's going to take tools that will be able to uh, explore databases, visualize data, expose those data to AI that's being retrospectively developed. Um, and then, of course, putting them into an environment that can be used within the clinical workflow effectively fundamental to adoption. So I think we'll see many of these sort of islands of capabilities around uh, data aggregation tools, AI orchestration tools, um, predictive algorithms for points um, in solutions, so to speak, workflow solutions starting to um, be aggregated and used within the clinical context. It's a very fragmented world that we live in, in the, in the healthcare environment, particularly when it comes to uh, data silos and different tools. The more we can create an ecosystem where these things can work interoperatively, um, the, the better. So I think we'll, we'll see many more of those. There'll be focus on specific use cases, particularly selection of certain therapies or um, stratifying certain diseases. And we'll need to work with uh, physicians, caregivers to sort of pull those things together. But we'll see these islands, I think, slowly coming together to form ecosystems of capability that will uh, support improved outcomes. And, um, you know, all of that's essential, but it's also critical that we, we work uh, together to make sure that happens. And we're seeing some of that happening already in, in, in specific care models like rapid diagnostic clinics or monitoring uh, of recurrence clinics, for example, or, or indeed um, infusion clinics and so on. These sorts of capabilities uh, uh, need to be tied together and used in, in a more uniform um, and integrated way. Can you share just a bit more on those islands, as you put it, coming together? It seems like one of the, the challenges potentially is you have AI coming into legacy environments. Um, how does the company work to kind of extend the reach of AI so that it connects more of the dots and connects the silos? Look, it's a great question. Um, you can give an example. I think one of the things that is, you know, frustrated me in, in recent years was, you know, we, we des design fantastically accurate, highly precise, highly performing imaging technology that will diagnose disease with high sensitivity, high specificity, and the physicians that use those devices, just incredible in the way that uh, they use them and also uh, their commitment to the patients and in, in how uh, those systems are used. The challenges though around after implementation of a device like that mean that the best is not necessarily obtained out of those devices. You know, if you have patients that spend too long in their journey between diagnosis and treatment, of course, that can lead to poor outcomes, even though you might have the best possible diagnostic imaging device giving you the most precise information. So tackling the imaging piece without supporting the workflow piece or the patient journey piece actually is a recipe for continued challenges around the outcomes. So, you know, as we kind of work to resolve these things, We've got islands where there are very good technologies in place. We've got islands where there are best in class workflows or patient journeys that have been optimized through great protocols, great management, great lean systems that we can bring together to fix, if you like, systems and use those best in class outcomes, and combinations of imaging plus workflow and optimized care models to implement in, in hospitals. The more we do that, I think the more we'll see digital solutions sustaining those improved outcomes, reducing time to treatment through those care models with the precise technology, 
overlaid with um, workflow solutions or data management solutions so that the whole ecosystem becomes sustainable and self-sustaining in a way. So those islands of, of, of technologies, services, protocols, um, digital solutions, uh, we talk about this a lot as our D3 and strategy, actually devices, disease, and digital coming together. The more we see that, I think the more we should be excited about how uh, these things can transform healthcare in the future. Well, there's not much to add to that beautiful ending. So Ben Newton, Chief Digital Officer and GM of Oncology for GE Healthcare. Thank you so much for joining us on AI Meets Lifestyle. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and congratulations again on your recent announcement. Uh, you're owning the AI space. Thank you. <laughs> Can't wait to hear more. And again, Ben, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Ben. It was great. Thank you. One of the cool things that Ben talked about that I found fascinating with AI and ML and deep learning is this kind of notion of you have humans plus compute. And there's been some people who've projected that AI algorithms would potentially replace radiologists or a lot of what they do. But it seems like what's actually happening happening is the technology is helping address a shortage of workers in that space. And at JP Morgan, I heard about this from the pathology perspective. So similar to radiology is also a shortage of pathologists. And one of the things that I recall that Ben said is you could see things potentially with deep learning that you couldn't see with the human eye. In the same way with pathology, in the past, you'd have sometimes a professional who would do things like count the number of cells on a slide or count the number of cells that were dividing via mitosis on a slide and glass and how tedious that would be. And with AI tools, you can come in and like within a moment, you can get an estimate of how many cells are on a slide or how many cells are dividing on a slide, freeing up professionals, in this case, pathologists, but also in a similar way, radiologists from the drudgery of having to go through like one, two, three, four and counting to focus on things that are more rewarding. So it goes back to that theme of humans can enjoy more what humans are good at, which is not necessarily judge work. They can be creative, they can problem solve, they can, they can, I don't know, they can do what they're passionate about and worry less about things that are boring. <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm really glad that you were able to tie in some lessons learned at JP Morgan. And it's been very validating hearing from you and hearing from uh, sort of the others who attended JP Morgan this year that we're all sort of moving forward in this new future. And we're just trying to make it work and figure it out so just one step at a time. And, uh, you had mentioned just now kind of AI allowing humans to be more human or focusing on the kind of the things that we enjoy as humans. And I think we've spent a lot of time talking about how uh, companies are using AI enabled algorithms or um, kind of leveraging that for technology. One of the things that we really haven't spent a lot of time talking about is how AI is being used in maybe the softer sciences could be a way that I put it. Uh, so go to market strategies or commercialization. So, um, and you know, from my own perspective, uh, AI has really helped me with my workload and efficiencies, but there's a lot of other uh, people who really focus on, again, commercializing medical device products who are using AI and really understand how that can build their book of business and uh, maybe uh, larger, I can help uh, bring devices to market faster. I can maybe share that message even broader. So for that perspective, which again is kind of more of those softer sciences, uh, we are interviewing Haley Schwartz. She is the CEO of Catalyze Healthcare and Catalyze focuses on commercializing a medical device product, uh, bringing it to market. And we discuss uh, how commercialization strategies have been impacted by AI. And then in particular, we dig into data and um, sort of the significance of the volume of data, uh, which has been kind of, Brian, a common theme in season one, as we've known as is really kind of talking about data. So with that in mind, let's hear from the other side of the industry, Haley Schwartz of Catalyze Healthcare. Welcome Haley to AI Meets Lifestyle 
Uh, we are here today at Device Talks West having a conversation. Thank you for being here. Would you mind sharing with our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Haley Schwartz. I'm CEO of Catalyze Healthcare, and I work with medical device companies and VCs struggling to commercialize in the U.S. Excellent. So let's talk about data. How important is the volume of data when it comes to AI, machine learning, and life sciences? So, you know, I think that if we learn from the past, it's really about quality of data and not just volume of data. And I think AI has such an incredible opportunity for us to really pull in more and more data, which then introduces the challenge of noise reduction. So either these AI algorithms will have to learn how to self-reduce or self-filter or something like that, or there's really going to have to be some good oversight. Well said. So let's shift from data to consumer. And in what ways do you see consumer comfort with wellness devices acting as kind of the stepping stone into more advanced applications? I think the main thing that that brought is trust and confidence. So when we're talking about the hospital arena, you have physician stakeholders, and they have developed their own trust with these devices, such as Apple Watches. And I think that that has helped sort of prime them. And I think this is part of where the appetite is coming from. You know, how can we then... Uh, you, like you said, use it as a stepping stone to bring in more uh, technology into the walls of the hospital. That said, you know, again, what does it look like? What's it going to be um, when there's a patient actually on a table who really needs a decision made right now? So we're talking about stepping stones. Let's move into the progression of AI. Uh, so how do you see the progression going from screening to diagnostics to eventually therapeutic applications? So I think this is a really great way to bridge that hesitation. So if an AI device comes in and it is a screening tool, we're still allowing the physicians and the world of medicine to do what it needs to do, right? We're only providing um, supportive information. From there, as the comfort level develops, I think we'll have the opportunity and again, building that trust and that confidence in these algorithms to move into the diagnostic side and then eventually the therapeutic. So I think it's a really nice way to approach the market. So this is a perfect bridge to talking about uh, this Goliosa screening app that you worked on. Can you share more about that and its significance? Yes, absolutely. So this is a Scoliosa screening app where a parent at home can scan their child and they can slowly gather the data over time in order to track the progression of suspected scoliosis. So what's great about that model is that the traditional way is that a child would have to go back to a clinic once every six months. You know, it takes five minutes for a screening and maybe they're measuring cob angles or doing a little bit more. But ultimately, there is not this um, really strong, consistent oversight of the disease progression. So now there's a way for the screening tool to be used at home more frequently as needed in order to be able to have, you know, the patient be followed or the child be followed. What's incredible about that is that rather than the parent or guardian having to take the child to a clinic that is 45 minutes away, having to find childcare for their other children in order for them to just wait for an hour to be seen for five minutes, come back home and do this every six months, they're able to do it in the comfort of their own home at their leisure whenever it is convenient for them and it cuts out the entire burden. So inherently you're going to have more adherence and you're going to have a better chance of identifying the children who are going to need some sort of intervention. What's an excellent example? Let's talk more about adoption and maybe the different pace of adoption. So I've heard you say that hospitals and uh, surgical interventions might adopt AI at a slower pace. Why do you think that is? I think there are two immediate reasons. The first is liability and the second is reimbursement. So when an AI technology is introduced and something goes wrong, a patient gets hurt. Does the malpractice insurance cover the physician? Does the manufacturer take responsibility? What does that look like? And then similarly, from a reimbursement standpoint, if in theory an AI will reduce costs over time, does that mean that the payers are gonna pay out less? And then what does that do to the hospital? So is it a disincentive almost, right, to be able to bring in these technologies? Well said. So shifting over now, kind of you, you mentioned liability, let's talk about regulation. I think that they go really go hand in hand. So how is the current AI technology sparking discussions around um, accuracy and regulations in life sciences? So actually, this is a fantastic time to ask this question because just this week, the FDA announced their digital advisory committee. And so 
as you know, digital health and medical devices have not fully intersected yet. They're not fully in the hospital space and in that arena. But I think that the timing of this formation is early on, which means that we're going to start to get some of those answers around regulation and around accuracy, which is the biggest concern, right? And we're going to start to get that more and more in a really well-supported manner. Again, well said, could not agree more, and the timeliness of this could not be better. Oh, again, we are at Device Talks West, October 18th and 19th, 2023. I want to shift back to clinicians. We were talking about responsibility and liability. How important and essential is it for clinicians to be involved with AI, even when the AI makes or the AI uh, algorithm makes a recommendation? Absolutely, and it's an important question. I think that the physicians need to be there in order for the trust to be established in the AI devices. We talked a little bit about wellness. We talked about priming the market. Yes, it's true that that's there, but it has yet to be seen in the OR, within the hospital walls, with your more with the high acuity patients, the high cost patients, right? So I think that the physicians need to be there at the bedside in order to really be able to trust these technologies moving forward. And again, f to allow these algorithms to quote practice under their licenses, right? I think that's one big piece. And the other part of it is, can these AI algorithms really account for all of the comorbidities, all of the allergies, all of the nuances that a patient might have in that clinical setting? Or does the physician need to be involved, which I think in this in part of the infancy, they do need to be. I couldn't agree more. And I would say that the general um, you know, stakeholders within the medical device industry would agree. So let's wrap up. What would you say are the right starting points when it comes to integrating AI into life sciences? I think operationalizing AI in the medical device world, in the hospital arena, is really where we need to focus. The logistics, the liability, the reimbursement, regulatory, et cetera, because the technology is going to take care of itself. We can do anything, and the question is, how do we implement it? How do we make it stick? Thank you so much, Haley, for being with us today. How can our audience find you? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you can visit my website at catalyzehealthcare.com or you can reach me through Device Talks West. Excellent. Thank you. You know what I really like about what we're doing with AI Meets Lifetime? We're combining different perspectives uh, from the different stakeholders in life sciences. So we heard from Ben Newton from kind of this uh, corporate perspective. And then we heard from Haley Schwartz from this sort of boots on the ground uh, consultant who's trying to help companies commercialize medical devices. So there's this, this duality of perspective and application, which I think is bettering our understanding of how AI is being used and applied uh, to the life sciences. So it's one of my favorite things about what we've been doing so far. And that's just the beginning because this is just episode three of season one. I think one of the only ways to understand this space is to talk to a whole variety of players from like the small startups to like the big tech companies to the big pharma companies to middle sized companies and just kind of like put all the pieces together. And that's part of the reason I'm looking forward to our next episode in which we talk to Helen Marianos, who's the head of Sanofi's R&D portfolio strategy. And they are making some headway with one of the most ambitious kind of like AI plays in big pharma. They put out a big ambitious press release last year talking about their, their ambitions in the space. And yeah, it seems like they're doing some interesting stuff in that. So I look forward to that. I'm Brian Bunce, editor of Drug Discovery and Development. And I'm Kayleen Brown, managing editor for Device Docs. We're being simulcasted on the Device Talks Podcast Network, so subscribe on any podcast platform to AI Meets Life Size so you don't miss future episodes. Once again, I wanted to thank Smart Track Business Intelligence and Catalyze Healthcare for making this episode possible. Please thank follow you. us on <laughs> Please follow us on social media. Thanks again for tuning in.